Good morning, church. My name is Kendall. This morning's reading will be from Acts chapter 14, verses 8 through 15. Now at Lystra, there was a man sitting who could not use his feet. He was crippled from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul speaking, and Paul, looking intently at him and seeing that he had faith to be made well, said in a loud voice, Stand upright on your feet. And he sprang up and began walking. And when the crowd saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in Lyaconian, The gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. Barnabas they called Zeus and Paul Hermes because he was the chief speaker and the priest of Zeus, whose temple was at the entrance to the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates and wanted to offer sacrifice with the crowds. But when the apostles apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of it, they tore their garments and rushed out into the crowd, crying out, Men, why are you doing these things? Why also are men of like nature with you? And we bring you good news, that you should turn from these vain things to a living God, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Thank you, Kendall. Today, uh, continuing our series through Acts, uh, before we get going much, I want to say welcome to all of you, especially those of you who are guests today and those of you who are watching online. We're really glad that you are here, even on spring break weekend, right? Y'all are the devoted ones. You can pat yourself on the back and uh, uh, feel more spiritual than everyone who who didn't make it today. That's not really true, but whatever works for you, right? Uh, as, as we're walking through Acts, we've seen the story of how God has been building his church through the power of the Holy Spirit. And, and last week we saw the turn of events where um, kind of the focus of the book goes away from Jerusalem, off of Peter. And now we begin to look at mostly the Apostle Paul and what God was ultimately going to do through him and a man named Barnabas as the, the church at Antioch sent them out into uh, unknown places uh, to begin to make disciples there. Now, we know that Jesus, just before he ascended into heaven, he commissioned everyone who would call themselves one of his disciples to go and to make other disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that he has commanded. But for the Apostle Paul and for Barnabas, uh, things just got more difficult, if you will. Um, Always before, as you watch through the book of Acts to this point, uh, every time that Peter or James or John or, or Paul at this point, every time they'd gone to preach the gospel, what they would do is they would go into a city, into the synagogue. That was kind of the meeting place of the Jews. And they would go into the synagogues and they would preach to people who believed that the God of the Bible was the one true God, right? And they would reason with them from the scriptures because they believed that the Old Testament scriptures, which is what they had at the time, they believed it was indeed the word of God. And so in a sense, uh, I don't want to call it friendly and I don't want to call it easy. It was only easier because uh, Paul and Barnabas, they got to go to places and preach to people who believed in the same God and in the same Bible. Uh, But now, having been sent to the Gentiles, which, by the way, uh, the, the Greek word for Gentile means ethnos. And so you could say uh, people group, a, a tribe, or uh, any sort of uh, affiliation of people that were non-Jewish at the time. If you didn't believe in the God of the Bible, you were considered a Gentile. And so for the first time, the gospel is going to the Gentiles, and it's not going to be as easy because they're going to be, uh, begin to preach to people. They're, they're now tasked with making disciples of people who did not believe in the God of the Old Testament. They didn't believe in the Old Testament scriptures. As a matter of fact, if you know much about Greek culture, you might have studied Greek mythology. Y'all, it gets kind of wild out there. Let me just give you a few of the gods because they were polytheistic. They believed in many gods, and they believed that basically all of these different gods controlled every aspect of all of their life. And so you have Zeus, who was the king of the gods. Um, he was the god of weather. Um, by the way, if you've ever uh, seen like on a cartoon or maybe thought in your head, if I don't do the right thing, God's going to hurl a lightning bolt at me and it's all going to be over with. That actually is a borrow from Greek mythology. That was Zeus 
abuse was said to those who didn't obey him or would uh, get, fall out of favor with him, that he would smoke you with a lightning bolt. So just so now you know where that, that comes from, right? They also had Hera, who was the goddess of women, of marriage, of childbirth, and family. So if things weren't going well for you in that regard, fellas, maybe you need to listen here, right? If things weren't going well and you weren't able to find a wife, well, you would go and offer sacrifices to this goddess Hera. Uh, so maybe then you could get married, right? Um, that, that was their thinking. There was Aphrodite, the goddess of love and beauty. Hermes, the messenger of the gods. Demeter, the goddess of agriculture. Your business not going well. Your crops aren't producing. Um, it must mean that you've fallen out of favor with the gods. You needed to go to the temple, offer sacrifices, and get back in their good graces. There were others. There were Athena and Dionysus. Um, lots and lots of gods among these people. Now, here's kind of what they believed. Happy gods help you while unhappy gods hurt you. And the trouble with the kind of their way of thinking is you were never at peace. Um, in one moment, so the God may, gods may be happy with you, and the next, they might be mad. And so um, if things really went, went really well for you in your life, it was because you would appease the gods well. And if, if you endured suffering or loss or hardship, you could only conclude that you'd done something to upset the gods. And so it is into this culture that Paul and Barnabas are now going to preach. Not a friendly group of people in a synagogue who believed in the one and true God of the Bible, who believed in the Old Testament Scripture, but a group of people who believed all sorts of things about all sorts of God. So today I want to talk to you as we have been commissioned, just like Saul and Barnabas, to go and make disciples of the nations. Um, I want to talk to you about how to make disciples in difficult places. Now, um, one of the things about the Great Commission, um, on the front end, it says go and make disciples, but that's actually a participle in the Greek, and uh, it, it probably the be a better translation would be a, as you are going. Sometimes we think that, that people who have been called to make disciples, you must get on an airplane and you must travel across an ocean, and then you can make disciples, right? Sometimes we believe that, right? But, but what God has called us to do is as we live our lives, as we go, as God leads us, um, maybe to the job you're in now, or maybe the job you're going to be in a year from now, or from school to school, or neighborhood to neighborhood, wherever we might find ourselves, we are to be making disciples there. But sometimes God brings us into particularly difficult places. You've probably worked somewhere where you worked a couple of days and you realize, I'm the only believer in this entire office or in this, this entire factory. Or maybe a, a time in school, a group of peers you've been in, you felt completely alone. Like, I, I'm not sure I have anyone to walk with me here, uh, but God's called me to make disciples. Maybe for you, the difficult place to make disciples is in your home. Maybe you have a spouse who's struggling with unbelief, that isn't here with you today, who doesn't want to join in in the things of God. I, I don't know what it looks like, but I promise you, if you seek to obey Jesus Christ in making disciples, you will find yourself in a difficult place, in difficult circumstances. And so I want to encourage you today from the Word um, on how to make disciples in difficult circumstances. Places. If, if you have your Bibles with me, turn to Acts chapter 14. Uh, we're going to begin in verse 8. In verses 1 through 7, they'd basically uh, done what I, I told you before. They went to the synagogues. They attempted to preach the gospel there. Um, it didn't go well. They kind of get run out. <clears throat> and so they find themselves now in the city of Lystra. Um, uh, let's read a, a couple of verses here. Verse 8, it says, Now at Lystra <clears throat> there was a man sitting who could not use his feet. He was crippled from birth and had never walked. And he listened to Paul speaking. So um, we don't get all the details here of the story, um, kind of the whole setting. Um, <clears throat> but it seems that this man who is listening to Paul speak, he, he finds himself, uh, well, he's crippled. This isn't a sprained ankle or a sore calf from working out, you know, too much the day before. This is a man who's been crippled from birth, which means he likely had to beg for his living. And so day after day, he would just have to beg from other people, dependent upon their mercy in order to eat. It's likely that this man finds himself <clears throat> in a somewhat public place, which would have been a good place to beg and a good place to preach. And so the Apostle Paul, coming into Lystra, he finds a rather crowded place. You know, there are people milling around, maybe conducting business, and he decides that he's going to preach there. 
And so we find this crippled man sitting in a probably a busy place, and he's listening to the Apostle Paul speak. Now, interestingly enough, we are not told what the Apostle Paul was preaching here. Uh, we don't get the content of the sermon. There are several of them recorded throughout the book of Acts, uh, both Peter and Paul, their full-length sermon. You get Stephen's. Um, we don't get the full-length sermon that Paul preached here. <clears throat> but here's what we can know. And the Apostle Paul told us this in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 2. Here's what the Apostle Paul did. When he went city to city and place to place, here is what he did. Here is what he preached. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5, he says this. He says, When I came to you, brothers, I did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest on the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. And so again, we don't get the whole content of Paul's sermon here, um, but Paul came preaching the gospel in this difficult city. He finds a group of people. He finds himself in, you know, a certain set of circumstances. There's a man sitting across the way who happens to be crippled from birth, and there he is listening to this message. So uh, the first thing I want you to see about how to make the gospel in difficult places is that we must speak the gospel. Y'all, we have to use the words. Um, The good news, if if, if you're feeling a little bit intimidated or if you've ever attempted to share the gospel and you thought, oh my goodness, like my hands shake, my voice quivers, I get sweaty all over, whatever it might be for you, um, when you attempt to go and to speak the gospel um, in any circumstance, if you feel intimidated or fearful, you're in good company. That's what the Apostle Paul told us happened to him as well there in Corinth. I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. For whatever reason, this is just a part of the experience of sharing the gospel with people. And it's happened to me in in front of a crowd of people, for sure, uh, to share the gospel. It can be really difficult. Do you know where I find it most difficult to share the gospel? When I'm sitting across the table from someone that I know and love who isn't walking with Christ and I find myself anxious, and I find myself uh, reaching for words. I'm like, I preach for a living. I should be able to do this, but suddenly it happens to me too, right? I'm trying to figure out how to communicate the gospel, and it becomes difficult. Well, here's the good news. The Apostle Paul, who was trained under Gamaliel, who was the leading scholar of his day, the Apostle Paul who could quote much of the Old Testament, who had out-excelled all of his peers in Judaism, who was trained in rhetoric, like public speaking. When he came and he preached the gospel in difficult places, he didn't use wise and persuasive words. As a matter of fact, he chose to know nothing among them except Jesus Christ and him crucified. If, if you feel like, in, in terms of making disciples or sharing the gospel, like, I don't know what I'm doing, I can't possibly pull this off, you need to know that Jesus Christ, you need to know Jesus Christ and him crucified. That is our message. Like, you don't have to understand all the philosophies of every religion. You don't have to answer every objection. You need to preach Jesus Christ and him crucified in the power of of the Holy Spirit. And so how do we begin to make disciples in difficult places? In our home or in the midst of friendships, in the midst of a, a work environment or school or whatever it may be for you that you find it to be difficult. Um, go speaking the gospel in, in, in good moments and in bad moments. We communicate the gospel to people that need to hear it. It doesn't need to be, hey, you're a sinner, repent today. Um, but rather, it can, it can be a communication of the love of Jesus Christ for the person or the people to whom you're speaking. You can simply communicate the goodness of God to people that need to hear it. So how do we make disciples in difficult places? Number one, we speak the gospel. Number two, we have to live the gospel. Look what the Apostle Paul did here in verse, uh, the end of verse 9. As the man listened to Paul speaking, this man who was born um, lame and never walked, 
He listened to Paul speaking, and Paul, looking intently at him, and seeing that he had faith to be made well, said in a loud voice, Stand upright on your feet. And he sprang up, and he began walking. This is a good moment, right? People are going to pay attention. He sprang up, and people began walking. And when the crowd saw what Paul had done, not just when they heard his message, but when they saw what he had done, they lifted up their voices, saying, and like Aeonian, the gods had come down to us in the likeness of men. These men and women had been looking for something genuine in their lives as well. Um, they didn't necessarily believe in the one true God. They believed in all sorts of gods. But just like people all over the world, in all places, they are looking for something that is real and genuine. And when they saw the power of God at work through the apostle Paul, they're ready to bow down to him and declare him to be God. And this wasn't just kind of sort, like they, they, they sort of believed this, like they literally believed them to be gods. Look in verse 11. The crowd saw what Paul had done. They lifted up their voices, saying, And like Aeonian, the gods had come down to us in the likeness of men. Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul they called Hermes because he was the chief speaker. And the priest Zeus, whose temple, or the priest of Zeus, whose temple was at the entrance to the city, he brought oxen and garlands to the gates and wanted to offer sacrifice with the people. Y'all, they're about to start slaughtering animals animals in worship to Paul and Barnabas, right? This is a, a really significant thing, right? They have seen something um, that makes them know that what had happened in their midst was not an ordinary human circumstance, but rather it was divine in nature. How do we make disciples in difficult places? Number one, we speak the gospel. But number two, we live the gospel. We have to demonstrate it to people. Um, we communicate the gospel both with our lips and with our lives, with our words and with our deeds. Now, you might sit out there and think, well, okay, Jason, if I could miraculously heal men born blind on the spot, I, yeah, I think people might listen better to me as well. But here, here's the, the beauty of this. You are only responsible to give to people what God has given to you. Do you, do you remember the story of Peter when he healed the crippled beggar? Uh, there was a man there begging at the temple gates, and he, he needs money because he's got to live, right? He needs money if he's going to go see a doctor or even eat his next meal. And, and so he's begging from Peter, give me, give me some money, you know, I need some alms. And Peter says, uh, hey, uh, I, don't, I don't have money. I don't, I don't have alms to give you today. But what I do have, I give you in the name of Jesus Christ. And he tells them to be healed. And, and here's the principle there. We are not responsible for giving to people what we do not have. We are not responsible for healing every person, solving every problem, fixing every crisis. But what we can do and what we are responsible for is to give to other people what God has given to us. Y'all, we're not normal people. We don't serve in the weakness of human flesh. We serve in the power of the Holy Spirit. The same Spirit which raised Jesus Christ from the grave and now lives within us. And for every one of us who's come to faith in Jesus Christ, He dwells within us, right? Right? He's given us gifts and talents and uh, abilities in him to use ultimately for his glory. And so you might think, you know, I got nothing to offer people. Man, I'm not sure God could use me. I'm not sure how he could work through that. But here's the thing. In our culture that is obsessed with self, getting what I can get, taking care of number one, me and mine, and that's kind of it. Uh, when we come in the power of the Holy Spirit and we offer ourselves in service to other people, when we genuinely love them, care for them, use our gifts and abilities to serve them, and people are going to know that something different has just happened in their midst. People are going to recognize those people love me beyond what I could get back in return. That person served me when they had no reason to. And you know what we do in, in, as we do that? We are declaring the gospel as we love people as Jesus has loved us and serve them like Jesus served us, care for them as God has cared for us, give to them as God has given to us. We are speaking the gospel with our lives. Paul didn't show up like, okay, here's a gospel track. I'm out of here. And Paul engaged with a man who, whose situation seemed hopeless. And I don't know how long you've lived, but you've probably met some of those, right? The situation seemed hopeless. But through the power of the Holy Spirit, it wasn't Paul who healed the man. It was the Holy Spirit of God who healed this man. 
and by loving and serving and caring for people, even when their situation seems hopeless. We demonstrate the power of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ. We do it with our lips, but we also do it with our lives. If we're going to make disciples in difficult places, we speak the gospel and we live the gospel. Now, <clears throat> just to give you a little more background, because the, the story is going to continue here. Um, as I said before, somewhere deep down, people are longing for something that is real. They want to see, uh, they, they know that they need something greater than what they have within themselves. They know that deep down, their hearts are not satisfied, they've not experienced the fulfillment. And so, look, look what the Apostle Paul does here. They have to kind of tone them down, like, please don't offer sacrifices to us at city gates, right? Um, in verse 14, it says, But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of it, as these people are trying to worship to them, they tore their garments and rushed out into the crowd, crying out, Men, why are you doing these things? We are also men of like nature with you, and we bring you good news. What is this good news? Now, this might not have sounded like good news at the moment. We bring you good news that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. In past generations, he allowed the nations to walk in their own ways, Yet he did not leave himself without witness, for he did good. Here's what the Apostle Paul's saying. You have not followed God in the past. You didn't honor him with your lives. You've rebelled against him. You've gone your own way. But every step of the way, God has been good to you. He did good by giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. He's showing the emptiness of their own idols. This, this word for vain idols here, it, it basically means useless. If, if an idol or a god is supposed to give you something back in return for your worship, he's saying they're worthless. They're worthless. They haven't given you back anything in exchange for what you've given to them. They haven't helped you. They haven't served you. As a matter of fact, if you look around, you need to know that every good gift you've had in your, in your life is from God. He brought the rains and the fruitful seasons and the food that's, that's brought you gladness in your life. That is a gift from God. Now, before we think, my goodness, what ridiculous circumstances. Never been to Lystra. We don't worship multiple gods. Um, Y'all, we live in a place and in a culture that worships vain gods, believing as we offer ourselves to these things that they'll give us something back in return but they never do. Here's, here's kind of the core belief that pervades our culture. And if you pay attention, uh, I promise you've been sucked into it as well. It's the belief that if I could just be blank, fill in the blank, then I would be satisfied. Then I would be complete. If I could just get blank, then my life would be full. If I could just attain whatever the thing is, then I would be complete. And here in the world, our culture, we don't worship many gods. We don't call them by name, right? Um, but we make extraordinary sacrifices in order to attain beauty or appearance, in order to obtain success, to get married or to have the family, to get the house or to get the car, to become wealthy, to become successful, to get the education, to get followers. Y'all, our culture... Men and women every single day sacrificing their health and their family and their relationships in pursuit of money they think is going to make them happy, and it never does. People spend countless hours in the gym obsessing over their health and over every little bit of food they put into their mouth because they believe if I could just get this body or look this way or be fit or attain this status, then I would be full. And yet there's never a place where you're beautiful enough or handsome enough or fit enough. There's always more. You're always left wanting. There are families who have been without parents because they're busy pursuing the next promotion or to buy a bigger house or a better car or a place at the lake or whatever it may be. You know, it might feel like we live in a culture that doesn't worship vain idols, but we do and we make extraordinary sacrifices hoping that they're going to give us the satisfaction and fullness and completeness in return. I want to say to, to us, there is nothing in all of God's creation 
that will ever satisfy us. But there's good news. We can turn away from those vain idols to a living God who loves us and who will fulfill us and satisfy us, who died that we might have life and have it to the full. It's true. We'll never be handsome enough or pretty enough or fit enough or strong enough or skinny enough or any of the enoughs. But we don't have to be. Because in Jesus Christ, we find the one who makes us whole. The one who says that we are worthy. The one who says that we were loved and demonstrated it for us on the cross. That while we were still in the midst of our sin, which means we didn't work for it and we didn't earn it, we didn't deserve it. While we were in the midst of our sin, Jesus Christ died on the cross for us. The King of kings and the Lord of lords, the God of creation, took on flesh He became a man, and he lived a life just like you and I lived. And he endured the cross that we might be reconciled to him. You are worth it. You are valuable to God. You are loved by him. You are made whole and complete in him. So as we set out in our world to make disciples of all the nations, and that may mean we travel on a plane over a body of water and, you know, speak the gospel to people who don't speak our language. And it may mean we live right here in, you know, in Oklahoma, eastern Oklahoma, and we work a job and we go to school and we do what we do. Um, Here's the hope. We get to call people to turn from empty, worthless things to a living God who will transform their lives. And so if we're going to make disciples in difficult places, we speak the gospel of Jesus Christ. We live the gospel of Jesus Christ. But then there's a third thing that I need to tell you. We have to persevere in the gospel. Look, look what happened to Paul and Barnabas. These men who they were just about to slaughter animals, offering sacrifices to them, right? They're calling them by the names of gods. Look what happened here in verse 18. Even with these words, hey men, turn away from the vain idols to the living God. Even with these words, they scarcely restrain the people from offering sacrifice to them. And then you jump into the next section here. But Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and having persuaded the crowds who were, who were about to offer sacrifices, right, declaring them to be gods, they persuaded the crowds and stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. But look what the Apostle Paul did. When the disciple, when, but when the disciples gathered around him, he rose up and he entered the city. Y'all, he went back into a place where they believed all sorts of strange things about foreign gods, into a place where they uh, one day loved him and the next day stoned him and left him for dead. He went back to the city and he continued his work there. It says, and on the next day he went on with Barnabas to Derbe. When When they had preached the gospel of that city and had made many disciples, they returned. This is the third time coming back to Lystra, right? They returned to Lystra and Iconium and Antioch. Now, look at the result, though. In the city where he came in and people were believing all sorts of things about all sorts of gods that could give them nothing in return, the apostle Paul came preaching the gospel, living the gospel, telling them, turn away from these vain idols to the living God. Look what he got to do. Verse 22. He came to these cities strengthening the souls of the disciples. In the midst of his preaching and living the gospel, and persevering, going back to the city not once, not twice, three times now he's been there. We see that somehow, by the power of God, disciples were made in that city. And he was encouraging them to continue in the faith, and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church... Do you see what? There's not just a few disciples there in the city. There's now a church that's ready to have elders appointed for them. Something started with the Apostle Paul walking into a city and saying, God, I don't know what's here, but you've sent me. God, I don't know what you're going to do in this workplace or in this school. It sure seems dark. They believe all sorts of crazy things here. They're not necessarily worshiping you, but he showed up in the city and he spoke the gospel. And he lived the gospel, and he persevered in the gospel. And what you see now is a church born in the city of Lystra, and elders appointed there. 
such that even when Paul was gone, the word was going to be preached. The gospel was going to be declared. Disciples were going to be made. So we speak the gospel and we live the gospel and we persevere in the gospel trusting that God is the one who changes hearts. God is the one who makes the the disciples, who transforms people. I don't know what difficult place that God has called you to. I got a bunch of wild friends from back in the day, right? And you probably have some of those too. And I'm still friends with them today. And that can be a difficult circle. Sometimes I get put into circumstances and situations that I have no clue what, how I'm going to minister or to care for people. You know what we do in difficult situations? We offer ourselves in obedience to God and we trust Him with results. As I told you last week, because Paul and Barnabas were sent out by a church in Antioch and they were willing to go to difficult places, the gospel went beyond Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria and it began to extend to the ends of the earth such that we sit here 2,000 years later and we worship God. We sing about the cross. And we seek to make disciples in this place, countless miles from Lystra. But the gospel has gone here too. And so my hope for you today is that you will remember what we said last week. In following Jesus Christ and his call to make disciples, it'll be costly. You'll face opposition. But you'll know that in the end, it's worth it. God can transform your marriage and your family in your workplace, in your school. And the question is, will you go? Will you follow after Jesus Christ and seek to make disciples there? Would you bow with me? Father, again, we praise you for your word. We praise you for your spirit. We're so thankful for men and women who came before us, who were faithful to proclaim the gospel. Lord, they were imperfect just like we, we are. God, they came in in fear and weakness and in trembling just like we will. Oh God, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ for families in this city, for the homes in our neighborhood, for our schools, for our places of business. God, we pray that the name of Jesus would be lifted up there. We pray that lives would be transformed. We pray that addiction would be broken, that healing would come to those who are hurting. And God, we we look to you and we say, God, here we are. Would you send us? Here we are, a couple of thousand years removed. But you're still the same God. And you're still doing the same work. You're still the God who leaves the 99 to chase after the one. So God, would you use us in that? Would you convict our hearts? And would you lead us to people that need to hear your message? Father, we love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.